you've been stranded in the middle of the woods to be hunted for sport by the richest people in the world. In this death game, no one is who they seem. Sadistic traps are hidden around every corner, and you'll have to outsmart everyone in the most brutal way to survive. What do you do against bloodthirsty hunters who will look for every excuse to kill you? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat every death trap in the hunt. Everyone on this airplane is going to die. This rich guy here is enjoying the spoils of wealth, but as the stewardess pours his champagne, everyone is shocked when a man stumbles into the cabin. This man has no idea where he is, but it's clear the guy's not supposed to be awake. Ted the doctor here calms the man down and gets him to lie on the floor. He then asks the stewardess for a pen before viciously stabbing him in the neck. Okay, this escalated quickly, but just because someone's a doctor doesn't mean you should trust them. As much as 70% of the population puts unconditional trust in their physicians because they know more about keeping us alive than we do. But nobody stops to realize that they also know more about killing us as well. This doctor here just uses expert knowledge to stab him in the carotid artery, which is a high pressure vessel that supplies blood to the brain and it's one of the fastest ways to die from blood loss. Now, even though this guy's been drugged, he has enough information to assume he's on a private jet. You'd easily be able to feel the jet engine rumble and the effects of cabin pressurization. Unless you're a blackout drunk billionaire, then it's safe to say that if you don't remember getting on the airplane, then you're probably here against your will. So stumbling out into the open like this is not smart, and we should first take in our surroundings. After waking up, I would stay where I am and keep track of how long we are flying for, because we can estimate that for each hour of flight, we've traveled roughly 600 miles, and we would get a better sense of where we are in the world by simply waiting quietly to land. But if they already knew we were awake, I would look for a dinner knife and try to take one of the passengers hostage. These people are completely unprotected, so they would do just about anything to save themselves. If I could trick the pilots into depressurizing the cabin in order to neutralize the threat, it will knock everyone unconscious from hypoxia. But there's a way we can remain the only conscious person long enough to kill everyone in the cabin. You can keep your blood oxygen levels saturated even at high altitudes using specialized breathing techniques. By breathing in and out quickly, you can purge the carbon dioxide from your lungs and improve your ability to retain enough oxygen to prevent hypoxia at high altitudes as demonstrated here by David Blaine. The man hasn't given up yet as he grabs a champagne bottle and breaks it over the doctor's head, but the sound wakes up a woman in the back of the plane. She grabs a shoe, walks up from behind, and jams the heel straight into his eye. This woman means business. The doctor drags the man into a room with another drugged victim, and she has no idea the game of her life is about to begin. The woman wakes up with a mouth gag locked to her face and has no idea where she is. She stands up and sees another woman in the distance who also has a mouth gag. She watches as the woman snaps the pin off of her name tag and rubs it against her hair before placing it on a leaf floating in the water. Her makeshift compass turns to point north, and she walks away, ignoring this woman's calls for help. Okay, this woman has mad skills, and we want to be surrounded by intelligent people to get out of this alive, so it's reasonable to think we should follow her. But this woman is actually drawing a false conclusion, because there's no point going north if you don't know where in the world you are first. The one thing that's more valuable than a compass right now is knowledge of botany and environmental science because we can use the tree species, the temperature, and the humidity to figure out where in the world we are. Different trees grow in different regions and climates, so if we already know we've been on an airplane and have a rough idea of how long we might have traveled for, we can build a radius of where these observable weather patterns, tree species, and humidity levels would fall inside of that radius and make a reasonable assumption of where we might be. If you are surrounded by coniferous trees, you are more likely to be in the northern hemisphere, whereas palms would tell you we are in a tropical or subtropical region. All of this matters because it tells us which cardinal direction we should be walking in. If I thought I might be near a coast, it would make more sense to walk east or west to confirm the theory so I can geolocate myself, and north would be the most unlikely direction to find this. The woman sees a man walking by and follows him to an open field where she finds several other victims and they're all walking towards a wooden crate in the center of the clearing. This guy takes the crowbar and begins to pry it open. Worried, the others run away to watch from safety, thinking this could be a deadly trap. Honestly, I can't blame them because unless it's Christmas, opening things from mysterious boxes doesn't have a good track record. As the man finally breaks the crate open, a pig dressed in a costume comes trotting out. But that's not the only thing in the box. As he reaches in and pulls out a weapons rack, taking this whole situation up to 11. Okay, 
First of all, we need to take as many of these weapons for ourselves as possible, but right now we don't know if we're meant to kill each other or work as a team, and this makes our next decision extremely important. If we run up to grab weapons, this guy might decide we are a threat and shoot us. He's in an open field and is an easy target to anyone who might be watching. If it's me, I would try to convince him he's in danger by staying out there and make him push this weapon rack all the way to the tree line and use it to take cover. Once the weapons are brought out of the clearing, it will be easier to find cooperation because we've already acted based on our mutual benefit. Now, as far as weapon selection goes, I need something lightweight and multi-purpose, so I would pick two pistols and a Nepalese machete. Both are easy to carry and run with, and at least the kukuris can be used as tools as well. The rifles are obviously more powerful and better for range, but they aren't good for every scenario and are impossible to conceal, so I would sacrifice the more powerful weapon for agility and stealth. The other kidnapped victims run up to choose their weapon, when this woman spots an envelope with a key inside and uses it to unlock this man's gag. They all start helping each other as this man hands her a weapon. She's never touched a gun before, so he carefully shows her how to use it. She begins talking to this guy here when suddenly a bullet flies by and interrupts their conversation. They all run for cover, but Blondie here doesn't make it. That's one down and ten to go. This guy goes around the side of the box and finds that the shots are coming from this bunker up the hill. That's when Rambo here runs towards it firing all his ammo but gets taken down in two shots. That's two dead and nine to go. This woman runs out of the box and into the woods, but she falls into a trap. This guy runs after her and finds her at the bottom of a punji pit. He manages to pull her out of the pit and carries her into the woods, but steps on a landmine and gets blown up, sending the girl flying. Okay. At this point, it's safe to say nobody here knows what they're doing. Charging at a bunker that's at least 40 meters away in the middle of an open clearing has zero logic. We are not here voluntarily, so there's no reason for us to fight these people. The only logical thing to do is run for the trees to escape and keep running until I find help. Honestly, if you looked at our surroundings before even opening the box, they could have seen this very man-made bunker and all of this is enough to tell them that they've been brought here to be hunted down. The weapons were just an excuse to lure them into the field for target practice. We now have to consider that everything we encountered could be a trap, and that logic should be included in our escape as well. If we know there are landmines and punji pits around, then I would let others run first so I can observe which paths they take, and choose to follow the ones that have traps, because they will have already been triggered and exposed by the others. This bearded man finds the woman back in the pit, and she's now missing her legs. She begs him to shoot her, but when he refuses, she takes one of his guns and does the job herself. That leaves four dead and seven alive. He crawls away into the woods and runs up through the forest, where he finds a wire fence with a road on the other side. He's joined by three others who ask him what the plan is. The man tells them that they're stuck in the middle of Manor Gate and they need to follow the road here. They all climb over the fence, but as they make it to the other side, arrows start to fly, hitting this man in the back. The others run away as he stays behind, blindly firing into the woods, but the archer hits him with an arrow in the throat and the guy gets blown up with a frag grenade. Okay, this guy didn't have to die this way. He could have kept running down the length of the fence to find a safer place to climb over, but also, rushing in towards the archer is not the worst tactic. A good archer can hit a watermelon from 100 yards, while a gunman with a 44 Magnum is more likely to miss. It's outside the weapon's effective range, so closing in would be a good tactic. But if it were me, I wouldn't run down this open path here. We don't know exactly where the archer is, so it would be better to run diagonally into the denser forest for more coverage, because we would be more difficult to hit. Once I've spotted the archer, I would wait for him to fire, and when he redraws the bow, I'd rush at him shooting my pistol. The three survivors run down the road and are lucky enough to find a gas station on the way. They run in and hold the place up, barricading the front door shut and demand to know where in the world they are. This old man tells them they're in Arkansas and it freaks everyone out because they begin to realize they were all kidnapped from different parts of the country. The bearded man is from Staten Island, this woman is from Wyoming, and Florida man here is from exactly where you think he's from. He demands that the old couple give him a phone to call the police, and when the dispatcher picks up, he tells them that they're being hunted, asking them to trace the call before hanging up. The couple are nervous of the gun in their face, and he assures them that he can handle it because he has seven guns at home. They ask why, and he tells them it's his constitutional right to own them, but this woman won't let it go. She starts to argue, saying that whoever's hunting them is just exercising their constitutional rights as well, and he shouldn't be mad at them. Okay. The most important thing to know about your constitutional rights is that you shouldn't waste time talking about them when you're running for your life. 
This guy is being triggered into a debate, and it's distracting him from realizing that this old woman is way too calm for someone with a gun in her face. I'm starting to think that finding this gas station at all is way too suspicious. If they stopped to gather information first, they would have noticed that the sign outside says, Seek and you shall find, which is way too inviting. But more importantly, there's a truck parked right in front. I would take their car keys and kidnap them, force them to start the car at gunpoint, and drive us out of here. Now, the car is so conspicuously placed that we have to assume it could be a trap like everything else. So if they were willing to get in and start the car, we can trust it's going to be safe. Getting hungry, this woman here starts eating a donut, but suddenly she begins to choke and falls to the floor. She's been poisoned, and the couple use a distraction to put on gas masks, as the wife throws a grenade that floods the store with poison gas. The bearded man gets blasted away by the husband, but the Florida man isn't dead yet. The husband comes to tell him that climate change is real before knocking him dead. This makes him the eighth person to die, and now there are three victims left. The wife gets a radio message from the other hunters that a new unarmed victim is coming their way, and this one should be fun. Soon enough, this woman Crystal enters the store and asks for a pack of cigarettes, paying $9.93 for them. But then the woman asks which state she's in, and when she's told she's in Arkansas, she knows this old couple is full of shit. She slams the wife into the counter and shoots the husband with his own shotgun before finishing off the wife. Okay, normally I would say smoking kills, but right now, it's saving lives. Cigarettes can cost anywhere from $5.25 to $12.85, depending on which state you're in, and that makes a big difference to a smoker's wallet. This woman's expert knowledge of federal, state, and local sales tax on tobacco told her everything she needed to know to justify killing this couple. But since I'm not a smoker, I would have to use another method to figure out whether or not this couple is full of crap. And to me, that would be their accent and colloquial vocabulary. Instead of cigarettes, I would ask what drinks they had, because I know that many Arkansans will call every soft drink a Coke as a broad classifier, instead of pop or soda. If they refer to them as sodas, it's a lot less likely that they're from Arkansas, and I would go straight for the gun behind the counter. The more important difference, however, is that I wouldn't kill them. If I can manage to take their gun, I would try to lure other hunters in by making them ask for help moving the dead bodies. The hunters would most likely arrive by car, so not only do I get to kill more of them, but I also get a safe getaway vehicle in the process. Taking some ammo for her new gun, Crystal here leaves the store and spots a pickup truck parked outside. Removing its fake Arkansas license plate, she finds a European one underneath it, revealing that they're not even in America anymore. She's about to get into the car when she spots a tripwire hooked to the door and finds it's been connected to a block of C4 explosives, ready to blow up if she tries getting into the driver's seat. Crystal decides to lie in wait and listens to the hunter's conversations over the stolen walkie-talkie. They haven't heard back from the old couple and want to check on them, but the woman is taken by surprise as a drone flies overhead. It looks into the gas station for the old couple when suddenly it's shot out of the air and the hunters turn off the radio. A man comes out of hiding and stomps the drone to pieces. He heads for the car when Crystal here stops him. She reveals that the car is rigged to explode and tells him off for shooting the drone. The hunters can't see them, but now they know exactly where they are and they need to leave before they're caught. Okay. Teaming up with anyone is a high-risk, high-reward gamble. Now, additional skill sets or knowledge might help us survive, but so far, this guy has a lot more cons than pros. He's already made two bad decisions with the drone and the car, and we can also tell that he's out of shape, which will both slow us down and deplete any food resources you might need to share. He's also more likely to get dehydrated quicker because fat traps heat and raises the body's core temperature, which will cause him to sweat more profusely. On a long walk, he's going to be asking us to share our water, and I'm not giving him a drop. If I were her, I'd ask him to wait in the bushes for the hunters and ambush them together from different directions. But when the hunters show up, he'll have to fight them off himself, giving me more time to escape. Together, they follow these train tracks, and the man shares his theory that they've been kidnapped as a part of the Manor Gate conspiracy, where a group of wealthy elites hunt the poor in an annual death game. But the woman isn't listening to him as she touches the rail to feel the rumble of a train approaching. She starts running as it gets closer and jumps on board before pulling the man up to safety. Inside the car, they hear a noise and go to investigate, finding a group of refugees hiding. Gary here thinks they're crisis actors pretending to be immigrants, and he's about to shoot them when the train comes to a sudden stop. They hide behind the crates as they see these European soldiers approach with sniffer dogs and order all the passengers to step off the train. Knowing they don't have a choice, they leave their guns on board and get out. Gary walks up to explain that he's an American and that they've been smuggled here to be hunted down by rich elites, but they don't believe him. 
Now they can't run away and aren't sure what to do next. But that's when this refugee here admits to Gary that he's actually one of the people hunting them and these soldiers are not a part of the plan. So he needs to calm down. Promising to give them a head start, he tries to make a deal to keep him quiet, but Gary is absolutely livid. He tackles the man to the ground and shoves a live grenade down in his pants, running away as the hunter explodes. Okay, we've killed another hunter, and that seems like a good thing, but it was a huge mistake. First of all, this guy isn't just a hunter, he's a desperate hunter. This game has gotten outside of his control and the military police are now involved. He needs something from us to keep him out of trouble, and that not only makes him the most valuable person in the world, but it also gives us power over him. I would be trying to exploit his desperation to learn more about who the other hunters are and where they are hiding. I'd then use him as evidence of the conspiracy theory when the time is right. But just like the drone earlier, this guy just wants to Hulk smash his way out of everything. This time, it's going to be a big problem. If these soldiers were real, they're definitely not going to help us now. They'll follow the rules of engagement and you'll either be killed or locked in a cell. And both of those scenarios are worse than being hunted. Crystal here is taken with the other refugees to a camp and meets an administrator who reveals that they are in Croatia. She asks him to call the US Embassy and the man guesses that she's been hunted just like Don here who's told them all the exact same story. Later that day, the American envoy arrives at the camp and agrees to take them to the US Embassy. On their way there, the man starts talking with them to find out what happened and sounds sympathetic. But when he asks if they know the reason why they were chosen to be kidnapped and hunted, Crystal realizes something is up. She kicks him in the head and throws him out of the car. Taking control of the wheel, she backs the car over the man's head before getting out and taking his gun. Dawn can't believe what she's just done, but when they check the trunk, her suspicions are confirmed. Inside, she finds Gary here with a knife sticking out of him. That makes nine dead, and they are the only ones left. Okay, it's understandable to be relieved when this guy comes to save us, but it makes us let our guard down because we think we're safe, and that's exactly when you're easiest to capture or kill. Luckily, we can gain the upper hand here pretty easily with some cooperation. Don here is in a great position to grab this guy from behind, and the man won't be able to fight back. Then, I would grab the steering wheel and force the car to the side of the road, put him in the trunk, and start driving it ourselves. I'm definitely not going to the US Embassy though, because these people are extremely wealthy and manage to smuggle 12 people across international borders. Usually something this extreme comes with help from friends in high places, and like I said, I'm trusting absolutely no one. Now I have to say, there was a lot of valuable information in this guy's head, and now it's splattered all over the road. As smart as this woman is, she didn't stop to ask which roads to stay away from. The woman finds a map that reveals where the man was going to take them, and Don here insists that they escape with the car, but Crystal refuses. She tells him a story about a jackrabbit and a turtle, which ends with the turtle's family being murdered by the rabbit. Crystal here is tired of being the turtle and wants revenge. That's when this pig trots out of the woods, and it gives her an idea. That night, the hunters are waiting in their bunker and passing the time. This rich guy leaves to take a leak, but when he sees Don holding a pig, he gets distracted and Crystal flits his throat. Then they drop the pig into the bunker and the hunters shoot at it. Caught up in the chaos, they don't realize that their game has found her way in and she shoots them down one by one. That's when the radio comes on and a woman asks Don here if he killed Crystal yet. Thinking he's actually one of the hunters, she holds him up at gunpoint and forces him to answer the radio. Don denies the accusation, but he raises his gun and she shoots him dead. Okay, that pig is a hero because he put his life on the line to save crystal and thanks to this little picky we get to go all the way home but now we have a really important decision to make here because we're the last person alive that can confirm this conspiracy and if i were the evil mastermind behind this i wouldn't let that person get away so even though we could escape we would be looking over our shoulder for the rest of our lives these people obviously have limitless resources and will be better at finding us than we would be at hiding the most logical plan is to try to find and kill the last of the hunters to finish this off. Now it sounds risky, but based on what we saw from the hunters in this room, we might have a pretty good chance of survival. First, they fired before they even knew what the threat was, wasting ammo in a small room that could have easily killed someone in friendly crossfire. This tells me they're scared and will always look for the easiest kill. Secondly, taking up a hunting bow in close quarters like this instead of a gun makes you vulnerable to a takedown because it's not an effective weapon in close combat and it takes too long to reload. Thirdly, they could have organized a flank or suppressed the threat working together as a military unit, but nobody stepped up to lead them. This tells me they are not prepared for the worst case scenario. 
all this gives me reason to think that any other hunters that I encounter are going to operate the same way, and that hunting them down is the best option we have if we want to live the rest of our lives in peace. This sergeant is still alive, and Crystal here makes him tell her the directions to the manor so she can finish the job. He warns her that their leader has been trained, but Crystal here is a veteran, and she's more than ready to take the last hunter down. She arrives at this manor and is told to put her gun in the mailbox unless she wants to get blown up. Obeying the woman's request, Crystal here prepares to fight for her freedom and walks in. Okay, this might seem like a lost cause, but it's actually great news. This is a huge manor with a massive gate and surveillance cameras, but instead of being surrounded by a security team forcing us to put the gun down, she's asking us to put it in the mailbox. We can reasonably deduce that she wouldn't do this unless she had no further security to protect her beyond this gate. This gives us a good chance, but it doesn't mean it's going to be a fair fight, so we have to figure out a way to bring a weapon inside without the woman finding out. Now, if it were me, I wouldn't have left the bunker without taking more weapons and ammo to face this woman. At least we have a backup weapon for a situation just like this. If they didn't have grenades, I'd try to find extra ammo, extract the powder, and wrap it in a cloth. We still have the matches we were given at the gas station and can use it to light a DIY shrapnel bomb. Now, this would be a total experiment because I've never made one before, but we're not being hunted right now, so we need to use as much of this time as we can to give ourselves the best chance to succeed. She walks into the house where she's greeted by a woman waiting in the kitchen. The woman tells her that she brought all of this on herself and explains that one year ago, Athena here was the CEO of her company, but was told that hackers found messages in her private group chat making jokes about hunting down the deplorables, and the hackers believe the text for real. Everyone involved in the group chat were fired from their jobs, but they swore to get revenge on anyone who spread this manner gig conspiracy by making the conspiracy real. Athena here reveals that she's done extensive research on Crystal's background and knows she was spreading false conspiracies about Manorgate, but then Crystal tells her they kidnapped the wrong woman. She's not the same Crystal these hunters are looking for, and frankly, she's fed up with all this bullshit. She attacks Athena, but quickly realizes this woman knows what she's doing. They're evenly matched, until Athena here stabs her with a thermometer and jams a food processor blade into her stomach. Crystal here gets her second wind, pulling a reverse Uno card and body slams the blade into the hunter. With the two of them exhausted from the fight, Athena here asks the woman if the hunters actually grabbed the wrong person. Finding out that she made a whoopsie, she finally dies, and Crystal here is left the victor of the hunt. Into the victor go the spoils. A nice cheese toasty, some first aid of the worst kind, and free clothes with a bottle of champagne. Getting on board Athena's private jet, she tells the pilot that she killed their bosses and asks to be taken home. As she sits down for the long trip back and shares some caviar with the air hostess, she downs her champagne and savors the sweet taste of victory. But what do you think? How would you beat the hunt? Now this movie is both brutal and silly and the perfect satire on modern day politics. And if you liked it, I highly recommend you check out Dead Meat's video for his own take on this crazy story. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How to Beat playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.